So as the title of the talk and the blurb suggested, I'll be talking about um, a bunch of things. I'll be talking about some theorem provers. I'll be talking about some logic. Um, and this is basically just uh, a little overview of the kind of systems that are state of the art, shall we say. Um, It'll be a bit of a code demo. Um, and I know that's like seeing someone type code into the browser or you know into the screen is not usually a great experience. But these are interactive theorem provers, and you really need to kind of interact with them um, to, to see how they work. So hopefully, um, you guys will get um, something interesting and useful out of this. Um, but to get started, I'll I'll be talking about uh, piano arithmetic first, uh, just to give us a little um, theory um, to to get us started in in improving something, right? So um, we're going to be talking about theorem provers, so we need some statements of logic that we want to prove, and for that we need uh, a theory, and um, for the people in Haskell who know um, singletons or who know um, dependent programming, um, the example of a vector um, is like the, the go-to example that everyone always kind of pulls out. And I think for, for proving stuff uh, using theorem provers, uh, it surely has to be piano arithmetic. Um, so, some or most of you will probably know about this, uh, but it, it's just going to be a quick recap uh, of some hand-drawn slides um, to give the theory in kind of an informal setting, and then we'll see how it translates um, into um, the three different theme improvers I'll be showing today, namely uh, Isabel Hall, Agda, and Lean. Uh, Lean four. That's okay. So. Um, the theory of piano arithmetic is basically um, the axiomatization of natural numbers. Um, and um, it's a really simple thing. It's, it's kind of the, the easiest, um, the most simple form of, of formalizing what numbers are. Um, so we start with two basic axioms or constructors, we say that the set of natural numbers is comprised of some element zero. And then we can always create a new number um, from any number in this set by adding a successor to it. Um, and in kind of computer science in notation, we write something like this. Um, and then we'll have a bunch of really simple um, rules or, or axioms um, that we'll be using throughout uh, to do with equality on um, natural numbers. Um, so we'll have reflexivity um, saying that for every natural number, um, x, uh, x is equal to itself. Um, we'll be implicitly using symmetry, saying that if x is equal to y, then also y is, x, uh, y is equal to x. Um, we'll also be implicitly using transitivity um, in our proofs, saying that if x is equal to y and y is equal to z, we can also conclude that x is equal to z. And finally, one uh, really important um, axiom is injectivity, um, though we'll mostly be using uh, kind of only one uh, side of the equation. Uh, and that's um, if x is equals to y, then the successor of x is also equal to the successor of y. Um, so that's um, some basic rules that um, we'll be using throughout um, our exploration of these theorem provers. Um, but one more essential ingredient that we'll need if we want to prove any properties about natural numbers is some sort of an induction schema or an induction axiom. Uh, yeah, there we go. So this is um, the induction schema for 
uh, these piano natural numbers. And it basically says that if we have some property, which is a function um, from a natural number to bool, um, so if a property P holds for zero, and we can also prove that assuming it holds for some X, we can show it also holds for the successor of X, then this rule um, will give us that our property holds for all natural numbers, uh, which is, you know, obviously what we want if we want to prove any any kind of interesting universal statements about natural numbers. Okay, so um, the title of this talk was um, 10 ways to prove 1 plus 1 is 2. Um, so I can write 1 and 2, but we also need the definition of plus on these numbers uh, before we can we can prove that 1 plus 1 is actually 2. Um, so that's, that's these two equations. Um, again, they're really simple. Um, one basically just says that adding 0 to any number is just a number itself. Um, and the other one is basically the, the meat of, of the algorithm, if you want to call it that. Um, it's essentially saying that if we have a successor of x and we want to add y to it, um, then we can kind of unwrap the successor from the x, compute x plus y, and then add it, you know, add it to the to the final sum. Uh, Sam, and again, the, 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 the screen, screen feed getting worse, getting worse and worse. Oh dear. Uh, not sure, sure exactly what to do. do. Maybe we Maybe can. We can. Unshared screen, 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 screen or something. I can try that, sure. This isn't... By the way, if if anyone has any questions throughout, please um, uh, please ask, and and Scott will stop me and and ask the question. Um, this is uh, this is meant to be a demo. So if you're, you know, once we get to um, the tools themselves, or or even here, if if you kind of if you're unsure about something or um, want to know more detail, then please um, feel free to ask. Okay, can we see this? Yes. Okay. 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 Well, um, I mean, one plus one equals two, that's that's kind of a boring statement though, right? Um, I, I mean, it's it's not really that difficult to see uh, that this is true given these two equations, right? Um, I'll, I'll show you in the in the tools, but um, in these slides, I wanna um, present the kind of informal argument um, for a slightly more interesting proof. Uh, in fact, it's probably like the, the simplest vaguely interesting thing about natural numbers you can prove. Um, and that's namely the their commutative or the addition is commutative on, on natural numbers, which is this statement here, uh, which is saying any two numbers, X and Y, if you add X and Y, well, that's the same as adding Y plus X. Um, so using our shiny induction schema, we can reformulate this statement as some property p of x um, such that for any x we have uh, for all y x plus y equals y plus x. So so we've essentially just kind of moved this x outside of the the, the quantifier. Um, and so then the theorem is we want to prove for all n p of n, where p is is our statement here. So if we, I don't want to scroll back because the, the screen might tear again, but in order to prove this, well, we essentially have to prove two things, right? We have to prove P for zero, and then we have to prove it for the successor case. So if we apply zero to P, then we, we get this statement, we get uh, that we have to prove that for all Y, zero plus Y is equal to Y plus zero. 
So we do some equational reasoning and we see that zero plus y is just y, right? That's just the first equation of our addition. And now we have to show that y equals y plus zero. Okay, but that's um, that's not entirely obvious, right? There's, there's no equation that I've shown you that um, we can apply here. Um, we can't we can't simply swap y and zero um, because we, we don't have a rule that that says you can do that so we'll have to kind of step out of this proof and we have to prove another kind of side argument um, so we formulate another property q which says that given any y y is equal to y plus zero okay so again to prove this by induction, we have two cases. We have the case where we substitute in the zero. So then we have to prove zero equals to zero plus zero. But that's kind of trivial because zero now on the left can be erased by the, the first rule of addition. Um, and now we have the, the kind of the successor case. So we have to prove that for all y, q of y implies q of successor of y. Um, so the way to do this is we assume q of y, and then we have to show that q of s of y holds. Um, so unpacking this, we have our, as our induction hypothesis that y equals to y plus zero. And now we have to show that the s so the successor of y plus zero is also equal to the successor of y. And if, if you know if you follow this chain of reasoning here, you can see that these equations hold. Okay, so jumping back to our uh, previous proof, we can now complete this step here because we've proved y is equal to y plus zero by by this by proving this property q. Um, so now we have to prove the successor case. So again, we assume p of x, i.e. that for all y, x plus y equals y plus x, and we call that our um, induction hypothesis. And we have to show that for all y, the successor of x plus y equals y plus the successor of x. Okay, so let's do some rewriting. Um, by the second equation of plus, we have that we can basically rebracket this expression from this to that. Then by this injectivity rule, which says that if x is equal to y, then the successor of x is equal to the successor of y. We can substitute x plus y, x plus y uh, with y plus x. That's our induction hypothesis here. And now the final step here is to prove that this equation holds. Um, but again, we're a bit stuck because um, there is no obvious way that I can see to do this, right? Okay, well, not to worry. We'll just um, create another kind of side theorem or side lemma, if you will, um, which proves that. I've, I've relabeled um, X and Y to A and B just to kind of try to keep it less confusing. But essentially, again, we do a proof by induction. Um, and we have to prove that zero plus successor of b is equal to the successor of zero plus b. So zero plus x is just x. So that's this first equation. And then within here, we can substitute b for zero plus b by using, again, the first equation of addition, but kind of in reverse. Um, and we kind of do a, a similar argument here. Um, it's, I mean, the, the point here is to just kind of show you the, um, 
the outline of the proof um, and the structure of it. So we kind of do uh, a couple of inductions and, and a bit of rearranging of terms. Um, it's, it's a little bit kind of tricky to follow and I've made um, several mistakes when I was transcribing this. Um, and, and these are kind of the, 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 the proofs that you really don't want to do by hand, this kind of tedious equational reasoning where you just kind of shuffle brackets around. Um, this is, I think, where theorem provers can really um, be a bunch of help. Um, though this is obviously only a, a kind of a toy example. But anyway, um, let's assume we've proved this. And so, whoops, um, we can go back to this step and and now R will be uh, applied here in this last step. Um, okay, so I think we now have a kind of a substantial enough proof that we can now um, turn into um, uh, so-called formal proof in inside a theorem prover. So let me just start with this one. Um, this is the ID for Isabel. Oh, by the way, are there any questions? Everything? I haven't seen any questions yet. Okay. Let's see a lot of people watching. Okay, that's good. Okay, so so this is uh, this is the first theorem prover I'll I'll um, show you, and um, we'll basically just redo these proofs a bunch of times in in several different theorem provers, and I'll just kind of show you what the similarities and differences are. Um, so first of all, we just have to put in the definitions for uh, for the things we'll be using. Um, so we start with the definition of natural numbers. Uh, if I can spell it. So we define zero and the successor, and that seems to be fine. And then we can immediately look at what this definition does. And, and you can see that um, Isabel generates quite a lot of stuff for us. So um, we get the induction principle here. Right. This is this is exactly the same as what I had on the slide. If a property holds for Z, and if for all X we assume P of X and show the successor of X holds for P as well, then um, we have proven this statement for all natural numbers. Um, we've got the injectivity saying that um, S of X equals to S of Y. Um, if and only if x is equal to y. And then there's a bunch of other um, little um, facts and, and lemmas that we'll kind of use later on to help us um, deal with some of the, the proofs. Um, okay. Let's define one as the successor of zero. Let's define two as the successor of one. And now um, the grand lemma that everyone's eagerly waiting for. One, oh, hang on, I can't do that yet because I haven't defined add, have I? Okay, sorry, jump the gun there a little bit. Okay, so we define addition, so that's just a simple function from nat to nat to nat. Um, and 0 to y is y. And x of x and y. Okay, so so this is um, this is how you define functions. Um, Isabel is quite an old um, theorem prover. In fact, it's it's the oldest of the three I'm showing um, today, and it's kind of got an interesting history. I, I don't really fully know the details, but it's a very flexible language. It's got lots of extensions. It's got lots of backends, and it's 
uh, it's got some interesting, shall we say, design decisions when it came to the parser and, and, and how things are. So you, you've noticed that I need to put some statements in, into quotes. Um, I don't know what that's about, uh, but you kind of, you just roll with it. And if you get a syntax error, then you've probably forgotten the quotes or you put them somewhere that, where they shouldn't be. As, yeah. Anyways, so we, we have a we have a function and um, functions in, in Isabel and in fact in all of these theorem provers uh, have to have a bunch of properties. Uh, they have to be total um, and they have to be terminating. Um, you you can do um, partial functions in in some of these systems. In fact, I think in all of them. But you have to tell um, the system I'm, I'm defining a partial function. Um, and, and this is roughly uh, because um, we want to have uh, termination uh, because we want our proofs to terminate and, and because if we, if we have um, functions that are incomplete or, or non-terminating, then we break our logic essentially. Um, so for simple functions like add, which are obviously recursive, Isabel uh, and the other theorem provers can automatically deduce uh, termination. So this is what this line is saying. It's found the termination order, bunch of stuff, but it, it basically knows that it terminates because we're doing some simple recursion on the first argument, which is getting structurally smaller. So in this call to add x, y here, um, x is strictly smaller than the the input argument, which was the successor of x. And, and that's why Isabel is happy and says, OK, I, I believe that um, this function will eventually terminate because we will reach the, the zero case on this first argument. Right, so now we have addition. Um, we can prove our first lemma, uh, namely, if we add one and one, then we should get two. Um, so the first thing we need to do is um, in Isabel, if we define a constant like like this one or two uh, via this definition, uh, whenever we want to inspect the structure of it, we have to actually unfold it, um, and we have to do this manually usually. So we have to unfold the definition of one. Um, and so what we're left with is actually this goal here. And now um, we just have to do a bit of rewriting. So the first thing we'll do is uh, oh, not ask that. There we go. Okay. So um, in Isabel, as I said, it's 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 an old system and um, it's it's been growing and there's loads of kind of interfaces as to how you prove stuff. Um, but the, the most basic and the simplest one is uh, the kind of the so-called tactic mode um, where you perform backwards reasoning. So you start with what you want to prove and then you kind of reason backwards um, until you reach um, an axiom, essentially, until you, you reach a rule which doesn't have any preconditions. Um, and so we use we, we use the the tactic language to do this, uh, which are these apply statements. So um, and and these unfolding. So the first step here, I say, okay, unfold the definition of one and two, so I can actually see um, what they refer to, and then apply the substitution tactic um, given this equation here. So if I inspect this equation by typing THM. Um, this is one of the automatically generated equations we get 
from our function add. So if I look at all the simplification rules, these are exactly the two um, that are the definition of our function. Um, and this, this is basically just a way of manually applying the, the function, really. So when I substitute um, the second line here, I basically rebracket the expression. And you can see how the goal changes. And I can now apply the first equation. And again, you can see how, how things change. And now this is just um, kind of trivial, right? X equals X. Um, so we can call the, the simplifier, which is called simp. Um, OK, well, that was the easy one. Uh, now let's move on to the, the more interesting one, right? Uh, the one where we want to prove that um, add is commutative. So SIMP is sort of a rule that it's sort of like a rule you can use in a lot of different places, it seems like. Yeah, so SIMP, SIMP is uh, the simplest kind of form of automation that you get in Isabel. You, you get a bunch of automatic tools. Um, in this example, I'll just be using SIMP. Um, there's also a tool called Auto, which is uh, slightly more powerful. Um, I, I won't really get into the automation much uh, within the kind of scope of proving things here, but I'll um, I'll show you um, one of the kind of more advanced theories uh, where you really get to uh, use the automation a whole lot more. Um, here, it it doesn't really make sense. I mean, the the simplifier doesn't have to do much heavy lifting. So, um, okay, so so let's let's get started on this proof. Um, so this will be a proof of induction on x and and um this is kind of a slightly different way of proving things as i said the the most basic way of doing things is using this apply style of of proofs um where you kind of just say apply 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 and then you know use a simplifier um but isabel the the goal of isabel is to kind of try to bridge the gap between formal and informal proofs. And to do that, um, they have a bunch of um, custom syntax that tries to kind of mimic the way, say, a mathematician might write a proof on paper. I mean, uh, it's, it's still very terse and mechanical, but at least in terms of structuring your proofs, it's, um, I think it makes more sense. So. To, to kind of enter that mode, you write proof and then you apply some rule, um, in this case, induct. And then Isabel automatically generates this proof outline of, of what's going to be needed to prove this. So we can click on that and, and it'll basically paste it in place. And so now we have this proof of induction where we need to prove these two goals. Um, So in the first instance, we want to show that um, Z plus Y equals Y plus Z. So look, well, let's see what happens if we try to apply SIM. OK, so you can see now that the automation automatically picks up the, the equation um, for the left-hand side. So we're now at the goal where we were before, where we want to prove that Y is equal to y plus zero. So we can start another proof. Um, we can do this in line uh, rather than pulling it out as a separate fact. So we can start an induction on y here. And again, we've got two cases. And this should be proven by simp. And so should this. Okay, 
So we've got, we've successfully showed the zero case. Um, now we move on to this case here. And here we can kind of demonstrate another feature in Isabel where instead of just kind of following the way Isabel wants to structure these proofs, um, we can make them even kind of slightly more human readable. So we can kind of introduce intermediate states or intermediate steps um, where um, we might want to have a, a step in the proof which is useful to, for the human to, to kind of understand the flow of the proof, even though it might not be necessary from kind of the, the automation point of view. So what I'm essentially going to try to do is mimic these steps here. So we can start with the, with the first equality. So s of x plus y equals the successor of x plus y. And again, the simplifier just blasts through these. Then there's a bit of um, special syntax that allows you to kind of chain the statements one after the other. So we're now trying to prove that this equals to that. Um, and at this step, if we go back here, we used the induction hypothesis, which in this case is called S because again, reasons. So we want to use our induction hypothesis and then using this, we can now discharge this goal by simp again. And then the final step in our in our reasoning was the second induction we had to do um, and again we can just do this in place um, And that's it. We have a we have a proof that our definition of add is indeed commutative. Um, hopefully, I didn't go too fast. But um, just looking at the time, I think I'm going to have to move on to the the next theorem prover. We got nine more. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I might have uh, I might have, might have slightly fit there. I think it's <laughs> going to be, given the time constraints, I think it's just going to be three today. So okay. We had to we had to prove you had to like have a rule for induction. I thought that was really interesting. It seems like it's like I haven't seen that in every theorem prover I've used. Is that something that is in every theorem prover having to define and actually defining the induction rule? Uh, well, that's that's an interesting point, and and actually we'll be coming to that in a second. Um, uh, not really. Um, so so Isabel is kind of a, it, it's based on kind of classical logic, and it's it's a fairly kind of standard classical theorem prover. Uh, the next two we'll be looking at are actually based on dependent types. And um, one of the buzzwords mentioned in the blurb, um, the Curry-Howard isomorphism is, is kind of gonna be demonstrated a little bit. Um, 
if um, f for for those that might not necessarily know what that is, um, just a very quick uh, kind of explanation. Um, roughly speaking, the Curry Howard isomorphism says that um, there's a direct correspondence between proofs and programs, or um, there's a direct correspondence between um, yeah, between proofs and programs. And, and I'll kind of demonstrate what that means exactly when we start looking at, um, at Agda and at Lean. So let's start with Agda. Um, I've already prepared a bunch of stuff because it's basically just the same definitions um, all over. Um, again, we define um, natural numbers. Uh, slightly different syntax, um, very Haskell-like. So this is this is probably the closest to to Haskell out of all of them. Um, oh yeah, we we open a bunch of things. We obviously need equality. Um, so we need the REFL rule that we had on the first slide. We need uh, congruence, which is one direction of the injectivity. We need transitivity. We need symmetry, and then a bunch of other things for kind of. Um, extra reasoning. Um, OK, so we've defined natural numbers again. Uh, we define um, plus. We define 1 and 2. And let's prove our 1 plus 1 equals 2 again. Um, oh, no. We have infix here, 1 plus 1 equals two. Ah, this is taking a very long time. I have to compile. Oh, All right, there we go. Two. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, I mean, this might be a bit anticlimactic, but um, I can just use um, something like like simp um, in Agda, um, and the proof is going to be kind of yeah, kind of anticlimactic. That's it. <laughs> uh, that's that's the whole thing, right? So what's going on in in Isabel? We had to like unfold a bunch of things and then call the simplifier and then like uh, you know use the simplification rules and do a bunch of rewriting. Uh, what's going on here? So I mean, it turns out that Agda being a uh, dependently typed programming language, you can notice that this. First of all, this is just a function, right? This is this is how we define a function in Haskell, right? We give it a name and then a, a type signature, and then the definition, right? So one is, I mean, it, these are constants, but um, uh, you know, we could we could define functions just the same as you know here, right? This is a definition of function, and it's no different to the definition of this um, this lemma or theorem. So the only difference is um, now um, here this is, you know, this is a slightly more interesting type. Um, this is not the type of natural numbers or, you know, a function from natural numbers to natural numbers. This is the type of the proof that 1 plus 1 equals to 2, right? And then this is the value, uh, which is kind of the witness um, which is the actual proof for the statement. And, and this is really the, the whole idea behind the kind of the Curry-Howard isomorphism that um, we, when we write programs, these now kind of correspond to proofs. And so in Isabel, you have a, a kind of the classical view of, of proof theory. And here you kind of have a programming language that allows you to um, to prove things by constructing programs or by constructing terms that um, encode this proof. Um, 
So this is the whole proof, this 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 raffle here. But obviously there's there's a bit more going on in in the background, right? Um, Agda has to do the same kind of or a very similar kind of reasoning uh, we had to do manually in Isabel. Namely, it has to reduce one plus one and two into the same thing um, because REFL is basically forcing both sides of this equation to be the same um, structural object. So in Agda and in Lean, uh, you have something called the elaborator, which is like the type checker that's been supercharged with also being able to do computation. And what the elaborator has done here is actually it's computed the kind of the normal form, if you will, um, of one plus one. It's reduced it to the successor of successor of zero, and it's also reduced two to the successor of successor of zero. And therefore, when we write REFL, um, Agda will be um, happy with our definition because it can indeed uh, produce uh, the equality on those two sides. Okay, um, so moving on to doing our proof of commutativity. Um, again, we have to prove the intermediate steps um, before we can actually do that. So I'll start with those first um, because it's not um, it's not as nice in, in ACTA to kind of have these things um, in like a proof script. You really have to write this as a, as a program, uh, you know, as you'd write your Haskell source code. So I'll start with a bunch of lemmas that we used in kind of almost implicitly. Yeah, the the input um, for for the Unicode is a little bit tedious sometimes. wrong There we go. Okay. Okay. So this rule is not strictly necessary. Uh, again, you can see it's been kind of proved for us directly by ACTA because, again, um, the elaborator can reduce this to just x and then x equals to x is easily proved by this raffle here. Um, the more interesting one we have to prove um, by actual induction, as we saw, is this other one, this add z right. And here we see another kind of facet of this Carrie Howard isomorphism, um, namely that it turns out induction and recursion are really just the same thing. Um, when we do a proof of induction, what we're really doing is just doing um, pattern matching on um, all the constructors of our type and then showing that um, the, the function itself terminates. Um, so to, to demonstrate what I mean is, you know, what if we just tried to do this, right? What if we just kind of said, oh, well, we want to prove this. Well, let's just 
you know, let's just do like an infinite loop thing, right? The thing proving itself. Uh, but Agda doesn't like this, right? Um, it says, oh, this is this is a bit problematic uh, because I couldn't prove that this, this thing terminates, right? Um, so, so this is not kind of a valid proof because we can't kind of prove X by assuming X and then showing X, right? That, that, that's not how these things are supposed to work. So we have to do a bit of work. Um, so, so me, um, perhaps you can't quite easily see what I'm doing, but um, essentially the way you interact with Agda is slightly different to, um, to Isabel. Uh, the idea in, in the Agda ID is you have these holes. So every time you type a question mark and then press uh, Control C, Control L, um, these are based on Emacs bindings. Um, then Agda runs through the file and then creates these holes for you every time it sees a question mark. So here we have um, a hole where our goal is to prove this statement here. Um, so what I can now do is I can type X and then do control C, control C. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try it. Whoops. There we go. So control C, control C um, basically gives you an option to to split or to pattern match on X. So this is what we did in the previous proof. We did an induction of, on X. Um, and now these are our two cases, right? And again, if we look at the goals, we see that they're exactly the same as what we had in Isabel here. If we go back to the cases here, we have to show the first one and then the second one here and those correspond to oh sorry i was in the wrong one wasn't i here this one z equals to add z plus z and successor right so these correspond to these two goals and again i mean the the proofs are at least for this case, it's trivial again, right? Uh, the elaborator can figure out that Z plus Z reduces to Z, so um, we're done. Um, if we try the, the automation here, Agda doesn't find anything because in this step, we actually have to do a little bit of work. See, it says no, no solution found when we tried the auto. Um, Okay, so let's let's have a look at the goal again. So we have to prove that the successor of x plus z equals the successor of x. Well, we know that Agda can reduce this term so that the successor is kind of on the outside and these two things are inside. So really what we want to get is a goal where we get rid of the s on the outside on both sides and then perhaps we can do something with the term in the you know term on the inside um, so for this we use this congruence rule and when we apply it we now get a new goal where we just have to, you know, the, the S's have disappeared and we just have to show the, the inner bit here. And this is where we can now use our induction hypothesis. Um, but where is the induction hypothesis, right? Before we had it as kind of a, a thing um, that, that was given to us by, by Isabel. Well, now we are actually allowed to call our function again, right? Now we, we are allowed to do the recursive call um, where we now call add z right with x. 
which will produce the correct proof, right? Oh, Agda is being very slow, and this is this is one of the issues with Agda in general. It is quite slow. Okay, we've we've gotten there in the end. Um, we'll need another lemma. Oh, what's going on here? There we go. We'll need the 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 other one, right, for for successor. Um, but I'll just copy paste that to kind of save us a little bit of time. Okay, so again, that's fine. Again, um, the structure of this proof and this proof are almost essentially the same, right? We kind of have the Z here and then the S of Y and then the S there. But if you look at the proof for both of these, they're exactly the same, right? which is kind of interesting. And so now if we want to get to the meat of our talk, wow, act has been, <laughs> I mean, like even by its own standards, this is impressive. <laughs> oh. Hilarious. There's a lot happening on your poor computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the fans are going like mad. <laughs> okay, we, we, have a, we have a hole for our, for our thing. So let's just... Oh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm showing quite a lot of things. So perhaps um, I should mention Agda has support for these uh, two different kinds of arguments. You, you can have implicit or explicit arguments. Um, and the stuff that's written in curly braces are kind of the, the implicit ones. Uh, the reason why this is, is once you have a language with dependent types um, and you write these kind of fancy um, types that represent proofs, or, or even if you use it for, for actual programming, like say, say you want to define a vector, um, oftentimes uh, what tends to happen is if you have your dependent type that depends on some parameter, say a vector of size n will depend on n, um, these, um, these programming languages can often figure out uh, what the value of n is supposed to be. Um, for example, if it has a, you know, if, if it has a vector, uh, then it can inspect its length and so it can figure out what n actually is. So um, often it's kind of a bit tedious to have to write this out as another argument. And then if you apply functions, then you can end up with, with a bunch of arguments which would have been inferred anyway. And so this is where these implicit arguments come in. Um, now, the reality is sometimes this works and sometimes you have to supply these implicit arguments explicitly because things can get quite difficult and hairy and um, these provers are often just not powerful enough to actually be able to figure them out um, all the time. And sometimes um, you need to be careful about how you define things and which arguments are in fact implicit and which ones should be left explicit and there's a whole kind of um, magic to it, I guess. I, I mean, you, you kind of just, by, by using these tools, you, you learn what works and what doesn't. Okay, let's, let's try to do the, the proof here. So again, we want to um, pattern match on X. So we have two cases. Um, so we need to prove the first statement here and then the second one. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Um, 
So let's just have a look at what we did before so we, we don't have to remember. So first we proved that y is equal to zero plus y and then in the next step we proved that y is equal to y plus zero. Right, that's that's this this reasoning here. So we basically apply transitivity. We we first proved a equals to b, uh, then we proved b equals to c, and then we can conclude that therefore a equals to c. Um, so to do that here in Agda, um, we can apply this transitivity rule. And now we've got two goals. We want to prove that z plus y is equal to something. Agda obviously doesn't know what this something is because if we go from bottom up, right? If we if we go from um, the conclusion, which is x plus y, um, no, sorry, what was it? Zero plus y equals y plus zero. Then we have the zero plus y, y plus zero, but in between we have this kind of hole um, where Agda cannot infer what kind of statement we want to prove. Um, but we know from our proof, from our paper proof, that we, you know, the first one should prove that zero plus y should equal to just y. Right, so we can apply this first proof here. And now, because of the dependency between those two, we have this first goal now where we just have the y. And this is basically just this add z right here, right? We've got x plus z equals x, and here we have to prove y equals y plus z, right? So essentially, it's the same statement, but if, if we try to just put it in here, um, Agda won't know how to deal with this because the arguments are in the wrong order, right? Mm. Um, but that's easy enough. Uh, we just need to apply symmetry to this. There we go, got there in the end. Okay. Right, let's finish up with our last case here. Again, looking at this, we have a bunch of steps uh, where we kind of transitively arrive at the conclusion here. So the first thing we'll have to do again, is use transitivity. And now we can start with um, the right-hand side here, the last step. Uh, we don't have to do this in, in linear order. Um, so we know that the last step here will be applying this add s right. But again, uh, the arguments are in the wrong order. So we just swap them. And now we kind of focus on this one. So here we have to prove that, um, you know, this middle bit here. Uh, and again, we kind of just want to unfold um, the successors away until we get this goal here in the middle. And this is basically just our inductive hypothesis. You can see that it's the same thing as we have here. So we can just apply that maybe. <laughs> Come on. That's really slick. 
I really like that like very explicit connection between induction and yeah yeah no when I when I kind of first saw that I, I thought that was really cool ah okay so here we have a, a point where Agda failed because he couldn't figure out the uh, implicit arguments oh well okay so what we have to do here is essentially just feed act of the correct arguments otherwise it complains that it doesn't know how to how to instantiate them and we're done how much time do i have left i think we're about five minutes over oh dear <laughs> okay well i'll just show you what lean would have looked like um and it's it's very similar to to Agda in some sense, and, and a bit similar to Isabel in others. So uh, again, the syntax is slightly different. For, for data types, we have this inductive key keyword. Um, we have to define the addition, so we just match on X. Um, again, we have the definition of one and two. And again, the proof that one plus one is two is just reflexivity. Again, this add z left and add s left are easily proved by reflexivity because again, the elaborator can just um, expand the terms until both sides are equal. And then induction again is just recursion. Uh, this is just a bit of sugar uh, so that we can just, essentially we just pattern match on this first argument here um, we could rewrite this in a slightly um, more user-friendly way. So we say x is a natural number, and then we have match x with oh, sorry, lowercase nat. There we go. And now this is just, again, just a function. Even, call, even though we call it a theorem, we could actually change this to a definition. And this is just sugar for us to see that some, some of these things are definitions, like the definition of add, and some of these are meant to be theorems. And lean is, lean is very new, right? Like it's, it's one of the newer ones. Yeah, so this is lean four. This is like the nightly. It's, it's very, very, very... Um, unstable i think still it's it's less unstable than a year ago but i think they've only released lean 4 into the public um maybe like a year or two ago so um yeah so so uh, as you can see it's very similar to agda what is different here is you can use tactics like in isabel um which in a way is a lot nicer right you can kind of um, apply rules and um, have kind of a more pleasant, I think this is kind of a, a smoother experience. You can kind of see you've got this kind of tactic state the same way you have in, in Isabel. And if you click over to the next state, you can see the, the, the state changes, you know, and, and you can kind of see the, the whole picture. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of proofs, um, again, I think this is very much inspired by by something like Isabel, where uh, it's just so much easier to to do kind of proofs in this way. I think I had I had so much more to show, but I didn't time this talk, so I wasn't sure if I was going to be like if I would have too little or too much. So I think I'll just finish it there. Well, I thought it was super interesting. I, it was really. Uh... Uh, neat seeing how different, how many different approaches there are to doing this sort of theorem proving. It's really neat. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, for watching. We'll try and get another Techlahoma talk together soon. Maybe we'll do uh, maybe we'll do a second theorem proving one. I sure thought this was really interesting. I, um, hopefully everybody else liked it, too.